Hi, I'm Deacon John Wilson, Education Enrichment Director for West Angeles Church, where our pastor is Charles E. Blake II. And of course, uh, our emeritus bishop is Bishop Charles Blake. But we're happy to serve under Pastor Blake now in his ministry. And I uh, have some key comments about Black History Month, because that's the month we're celebrating at our church, like many other churches, uh, Black churches and white, I guess, I don't know, across the country. And I'm going to talk about Black History Month in a way that's not commonly discussed. And it's probably because well, for a lot of reasons, that's not the purpose of this video, uh, but um, I need to do this after looking around on YouTube and looking at different services yesterday, uh, you know, video clips from services, I noticed that there seems to be a big confusion about Black History Month and critical race theory. So I want to talk about Black History Month first. Um, Black History Month, I'm not going to cover the history of it. You guys know uh, its history. Um, it came out of a, a movement back in the early 1900s. Uh, but uh, I think it is important. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that Black History Month is not important. Uh, and I guess, I suppose, for uh, due to where we are right now, it should be observed. Um, I, however, wish that we could have such a, a systemic knowledge of American history, which would include an understanding that Black folks are a huge part of our American history. I probably won't even did it here, but let me, I feel, I feel a need to prove it uh, by talking about different people that may, you may or may not have heard of. But Black folks are a serious part of American history, just built into it. It didn't matter. And by the way, all these people I'm mentioning came at a time where Blacks were enslaved or in slavery, however you want to say it. I like in slavery better because I want to really, really uh, describe the horribleness of it. So they were in slavery and many were freed or escaped Blacks that rose quickly to prominence. Some were freed already, um, but there were at a time certainly when Black folks didn't get the best of rights, even from so-called liberals in the North. But again, that's another video. And one day I wish I could do a video, video on Blacks in American history, but let me just do this. First, we have Crispus Attucks, 1723 to 1770. Probably the person here you'll be the most familiar with that I'm bringing up. He was the first to die for uh, the cause of the American Revolution and freedom from Great Britain. Phyllis Wheatley, and any one of these people could be a separate biographical study. And I encourage you to look them up later. Um, I have their names below in the, uh, in, in, the, in the captions below. Maybe you can look them up and study them. Phyllis Wheatley, 1753 to 1784. Very short life, 31 years. She was a poet and abolitionist. She was the second great female poet in American history. During the Revolutionary Period, she was George Washington's favorite poet, right? He would ask for her poems to be read in his camp with his soldiers. He had some very kind words to say about her. Let me move on. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. I'm just making a point. Salem Poor, bet you never heard of him. I heard of him on my trip to um, uh, Boston for the first time ever, and I looked into him afterwards. Uh, he's a great hero of the Battle of, Battle of Bunker Hill, which the Americans lost. They ran out of ammunition, but they inflicted so many casualties on the British that it reverberated around the world. And, and it and it really was the initial reason the French got interested in what was happening. They would later help us in the war. Um, so a very important battle. He also was a veteran of the Battle of Lexington and Concord. In the Battle of Concord, he was actually injured. He was allowed to forget this his leadership other over other soldiers and his bravery, right? And this came at a time where Black folks were second citizens. Think about that. James Armstead Lafayette, 1748 to 1830. He was an important double agent during the war, a spy of the latter part of the revolution. He infiltrated the British lines at Yorktown and provided valuable intelligence to General Washington and Alexander Hamilton for their attack on the redoubts 
and the forts at Yorktown or Yorktown. In fact, it's probably a little known fact that George Washington relied heavily on spies. And he's probably not the only black spy that was used. Madam C.J. Walker, some of you may be familiar with it, 1867 to 1919, she was the first, uh, first millionaire woman, female woman millionaire, and she was a black woman. Many great inventors like Garrett Morrison, George Washington Carver. In fact, I'm going to include below a link to 120 things created by Black Americans. And it's an amazing list. And it is not a complete list, as the author tells you on the site. Uh, so you can click on that link and see that below. The very STEM history of the world, I believe, has been highly positively impacted by African civilization and each, or as demonstrated through Egypt and the pyramids. Don't want to get into a lot of detail. Now, in fact, I'll include a link below uh, to talk about the that talks about the Ashanga bone and about early calculations and about how the students of Pythagoras were trained in the Pythagorean theorem, how they were shown with the edges of a square and went back to Europe and put it into practice. Sports, the real reason, I, I probably should talk more about that. Uh, when it was when mathematics was in black culture and Egyptian culture, which was black culture because the Egyptians migrated from Central Africa, we know that we can tell by the pyramids that go up the Nile because the Nile flows upward, which is another whole interesting thing. Only major river in the world that does that. Um, their mathematics was part of their religious worship, whereas in Europe they took it and unbound it from religion. And it was more secular, and so it developed differently. That's all. Sports, art, music, education, and the tradition of Booker T. Washington, science, defense, and many more are all positively impacted by Black Americans. So we don't need a Black History Month to tell us that. It's embedded in American history. So we have Black History Month. I think it's important because it allows me to say what I just said and be heard, right? But let's not go overboard and think it's the only time. We really should always understand that and always see ourselves today as a community that way. How about my personal experiences? Despite these achievements, Black students to this era of this era are horribly underperforming in our public schools in math, science, and other subjects. If you think about it, that's astounding. It only took two generations because math students were, were doing very well in the 40s and 50s in their own high schools. We were producing great Black uh, mathematicians and scientists even then, okay? But uh, in the last few years, things have gone horribly wrong. It seems that as more and more Black administrators and Black folks got administrative positions, it became harder and harder. I, it almost seems like more to say on that in a minute. Many say that this is due to racism when predominantly black school boards are being elected over and over again, or if not predominantly, certainly a influence of black leaders on the school boards. We have that here in Long Beach, and I know we have it in LAUSD. And when I visited LAUSD recently, there are a lot of great black administrators there. Sure, there were white ones too, but I don't know. But then I saw all races down there. I saw Hispanics. I saw Asians. I, I don't. I don't know about the racism thing. Um, in future videos and video interviews, in fact, I will address this as a new institutional type of racism and how a growing number of Black leaders are coming to realize this. Right? That you have this concentration of power of minorities, but yet Black folks have, are getting worse and worse academically. My experience is that every low-performing Black student that hits our summer program, our homework club, or now our family enrichment program, they get better. Some of them totally turn around. We have some great success stories. And some of you students who are alums are watching this video right now, you're thinking, oh, yeah, that's me. Turn it around. My own daughter, Andrea, just a wonderful young lady. I know I'm biased. I don't care. Uh, she wasn't doing so well. My oldest daughter wasn't doing well in math. Then he hit the math leadership in my program and it totally turned them around. 
and science and math. Just a little interest by the community goes a long way. One time Bishop told me that. One time Bishop was, I was telling him the stuff we were doing. He said, that's great. There's just a little interest in these kids will make them get better. And I, I was so close to it, I didn't see it. But he is absolutely right by just showing an interest in students can help them to succeed. Black students thrive where there is high expectation and community support for youth education to offset the lack of fathers and family structure. We must understand that. It's not racism. If you attack racism and white folks is the problem, you miss the fact that our families are in a moral crisis. I'll have more to say about that when God gives me the right words to speak about that. But we have some real moral issues in our community that are affecting the education of our students. As a deacon of West Angeles and the Education Richard Program Director, I recognize the founding of the first deacon board as a great example. See, I have to approach all problems, being, we being a faith-based organization, from a biblical perspective. Now, a lot of you who may not believe in God or the Bible, just stay with me. I think you'll see where I'm headed. James 1 and 27 says, pure and unblemished religion. Hey, you want good religion? Have you got good religion? Whatever that song is, I don't know. Do you want pure and unblemished religion in the sight of God and our Father? Well, it's this, to visit and look after the fatherless. And boy, do we have a problem with fatherless. This list. I got to do something about fatherlessness in the Black community. It's it is the number one social problem in our community. It's the explanation of why we have black men hunting black men in this community and killing them. I, I guess we had another weekend in Chicago. I checked or heard, I was flipping through the, they, where literally dozens of black men were shot by other black men last night. But do we find anything about this in the media? In fact, last year, about 9,000 times that happened. If my God, if a young black man can young black men in our communities or even Hispanic can escape the crime of the streets, they have a chance to be successful. But that's another whole subject. So this scripture says, look after the fatherlessness, fatherless and the widows or the single women, single women trying to run families, trying to hold things together in their distress and keep oneself uncontaminated by the secular world. But there are contaminations of thought in this secular world that we must, as Christians, stand against. Hallelujah. Acts 6, 1 to 4. Now about this time, when the number of disciples was increasing, a complaint was made by the Greek-speaking Jews against the native Hebrews. Listen to this. Because their widows were being overlooked in the serving of food. I equate basic education, basic means to succeed, basic means of getting ahead. I equate all of that, any kind of enrichment, I equate with food. And in our communities, we have a crisis that our Black students are being overlooked, I would say Brown too, but in the serving of food. I think anyone in the inner city, if you have whites in the inner city, if you have Asian, I know some Asians, and right here in the Long Beach, I know this man who has a, a enrichment program for Vietnamese students. Inner city students are being overlooked. We have all these great politicians. I'm talking about Black History Month, but I'm going to tie it all together in a minute. As a community-based educator, and one, I'm sorry, let me go back for a minute. So critical race theory is regarded as the answer by many, like Ibram X. Kendi and Crenshaw and some of these other people have voiced, and even some current Black politicians and some inner city politicians have stated that critical race theory, which is a theory, by the way, and it's not Black history and cultural achievement. And it says nothing to that. We will get back to that in a minute. It's a theory, and it does not acknowledge Black achievement and potential. As a community-based educator and one who has studied CRT from a biblical and evangelical perspective, it unnerves me to hear Black leaders publicly, and even from pulpits of the church, this month state that the teaching of Black culture and history 
either is CRT or a part of CRT. That is not true. They seem to think that if a white person states that they are opposed to CRT, they are racist who oppose the teaching of Black American history or culture. This is laughable. What is happening to our understanding of things? Is the media that corrupt that we're losing a sense of the definitions of things and what people are calling themselves? I mean, I know a lot of these words have changed and that's part of the problem, but we got to keep up. We got to keep up with truth. Truth is an important thing to believers because it's the only thing that can keep us free. If the enemy can keep us getting things that are not true, like that CRT is actually history, that we can be bound. And I think we are many times when I hear these things from learned men of God, men and women of God, that when they talk about history, it's CRT. Hallelujah. And call white folks racist because they don't believe in CRT. And if black leaders like me state, and somebody's thinking that right now, I know I'll probably get a comment down there like this. I don't know. Or somebody will back channel me somewhere and say that I'm a sellout or that I'm dumb and many other racially insulting things. I may be a lot of things, but I'm not a sellout. As you can see from my tone, I'm deeply concerned about the success of black and brown youth, or like you all would say, people of color. I'm so concerned about all youth, really, but I'm trying to make sure I'm clear to you. I consider all that kind of stuff insulting racially, even though it's coming from within the community towards people like me. Well, what is CRT? How does it undermine Black History Month? First of all, it divides people into categories of oppressor versus oppressed, just based on racial, ethnicity, and or skin color. And where I come from, I was always raised to say, that's racism. Whites are oppressors and Blacks are oppressed only by the fact of their race. This oppression creates a lowering of expectation. That's a very important sentence. I'm going to say it again. This oppression creates a lower of expectation because we can say we're oppressed, then not as much as expected of us. In other words, I put it this way, you poor little black child, you can't do anything because I'm a bad racist story. Or even among black people say, hey, you poor little child, you need the help of the white man. So you can't make it, you need more money. You, need... you see what I mean? It can create that impression. A belief that bad education outcomes for black students are mostly or all a result of racism and discrimination. <laughs> That's CRT. According to them, therefore, the path forward is more discrimination or racism against the oppressor. Therefore, one should be anti-racist in a kinetic or a action-oriented sense. It's not enough to say, I'm not racist. Here's why. You have to do something discriminatory. Let me get into that. You must agree that one, especially whites, should be willing to allow racism against whites and Asians even now I'm seeing as a means to allow black students to have better outcomes. That sounds weird. We're gonna hold back people to create the impression that blacks have better outcomes rather than working on the reasons why blacks do not, black students do not have good outcomes anymore. Now, this idea from CRT is being enacted in education policy. Now, notice I didn't say CRT. Stop, hey, folks, those of you who, who are critical of the system, stop saying we're teaching CRT. We are not teaching CRT in the schools. Stop saying that. It is wrong for you to keep saying that from this day forward after hearing this. CRT is taught in law schools. And that's a separate thing I probably should do a video on, but I know I won't get to it, so I ain't saying nothing. Okay? That's what critical race theory was first created for. But now we're applying it to the educational system, which is why I'm in front of you, because I'm concerned in Black History Month that we need to see this is happening. So now this idea of 
CRT is being acted, enacted in education policy, whether it's the new California math framework still under review for two years now, almost two years, because there's been an, a block of educators of which I'm loosely attached to that has been stopping it and by putting out the truth about what it was saying. It was very weak on substance of math teaching to minority students and other students. It was heavy on the ideas of oppressed and oppressor and equity ideas, which I'll discuss in a moment. It originally documented the basis for the elimination of AP courses and even algebra in the eighth grade due to the lack of participation proportionally of black and brown students. In fact, this has already started in all major school districts that I'm aware of. The fastest has been in San Francisco, where you might know from the news that they recently recalled uh, several board members or some people on the board, on their school board, because of this. Please, parents, let's wake up to the effects of CRT. It is a threat to Black students that, that can actually do math and science well but do not know all the ways outside of school to get that training and knowledge if you take it out of the school or remove their access. This is gonna disproportionately hurt the students you saying you're trying to help. Why just dash all the successful black students and brown students just to advance your, your theory, or put your theory and your teachings into work in the schools? School, listen closely, the public schools should not be a social experiment. These are students, they're individuals. We should not be experimenting on them. But that's part of a greater thing happening in culture to our young people. And I will address that in the video. I see the society as killing or coming down, squeezing our youth more and more by taking the role of parent over our children. I see it in a lot of things happening right now, which I won't cover here. Please, parents, let's wake up to the effects of CRT. Not so much CRT, but the CRT-related processes that are in policy. It is a threat to Black students that can do it well, but can't get it outside. Indeed, white and Asian families proportionally know of these resources. I've talked about that in recent videos and podcasts. I'll include a couple of those below. I was interviewed uh, on a couple of podcasts about that. Another term you hear a lot that has, comes from CRT is equity, which used to mean fairness in a general sense, but it has come to mean racial equity, which means anti-racist, remember kinetic, action-oriented policies or diversity, equity, and inclusion programs to get better outcomes. EEP is opposed. We believe with equal opportunity and equal educational quality, or else we would not exist. Why would we even be here? if we think it's futile to educate our black youth because it's just racism in the world anyway. In the words of the great James Brown, that great philosopher, I don't want nobody to give me nothing. Open up the door and I will get it myself. In fact, you know, I think I'm gonna include his song below. You can link to it, listen to it on your own. I have, it's a great, the verses are great. It actually is telling the story of this video. With that attitude, right? Of, one, of thinking that you can just open the door and I'll get it. Open the door is giving me the opportunity. Just open the door and I'll get the outcomes. I'll get higher test scores. I'll get into college more. I'll graduate from high school more. I'll become a doctor, a lawyer, a dentist, hallelujah, a preacher, a minister, a teacher. Mm. I'll do all those things if you open up the door and give me an equal chance to do, which is opportunity. Not seeing that with that attitude, one should get the opportunity to succeed and not as a not as a victim of the oppressor. That's not how we're going to get ahead, students. B making our students oppressors is not how we get ahead. Oppressed is not how we get ahead. They're not victims. They're not victims. I feel like the spirit saying again, they are not victims. They can make it. Would you want an education enrichment director that thinks black and brown children are victims? I hope you don't, because I don't think they're victims. I think they're, ooh, glory to God. They're opportunities for us at EEP to help them to succeed. And that's what all my workers feel. 
I have some great workers. I have Andrea, I have Yared, I have Larry Scaife, I have Nicole, I have all my great administrative team. I have Giselle. I have people that care about these youth and care about helping them to succeed. Won't you give us a chance? Won't you come in and find out about our programs? Even if it's just we're helping them online, we're trying to get in person really soon. We're gonna have a great summer program. We do great with College of Richmond. So clearly I believe that we work on the opportunity end. We wanna give your youth an opportunity and improve the educational quality of those students. Not seeing this way, it this way totally ignores the potential of our black students to succeed, like their many black American predecessors. I want to see more of those people, more Madam C.J. Walkers and Salem Poors and Christmas Addixes and George Washington Carver, you know, and uh, Garrett Garrett uh, Morgan, and I want to see more uh, of those people. I didn't mention Frederick Douglass because I want to do a separate video on him. He needs a separate video. We're going to talk about him separately. I talked about him in an earlier video about why the, we're the enrichment program. But I think that's going to be my one of my next upcoming videos because he needs a separate discussion. He's too much for this. This ability is still within our community and the individual and not the government. I don't have faith in the government on this. Not in white folks or, or anti certainly not anti-racist theories. In other words, our black students can make it like those early black Americans, early, earlier black Americans, and even today are successful in making it. That is the real message of Black History Month. God bless you. Bye-bye now.